We know Australian birds are special, and the rest of the world does too. Songbirds, like our lyrebird, are the most amazing mimics on Earth. Our parrots are incredibly smart and adaptable. Our pigeons eat fruit, move seeds and shape entire forests. But for most of the last century, scientists from the Northern Hemisphere assumed that our birds are just a second-hand fauna, descended from theirs. That's where birds had evolved, that's where you had normal birds, what was going on in Australia, it was a bit wacky, and that you could get away with that because it was this lost, forgotten continent in the south. It was only in recent decades that Australian scientists dared to challenge the orthodoxy from Europe and America. And now at least three different groups of birds have revealed something amazing that rocked the world of science. They all had their evolutionary origin in Australia before spreading to the rest of the world, not the other way around. Knowing that this continent was the birthplace of songbirds, parrots and pigeons helps to explain their close relationship with Australian vegetation and their extraordinary behaviours. Why Australian birds are more likely to be intelligent, aggressive, loud, melodious, socially cooperative, environmentally influential, and more important for pollination than anywhere else. When it comes to unravelling the origins of songbirds, Les Crestidas and Walter Bowles played a big part in turning the world on its head. Back in the 80s, Les and his colleagues decided to test early DNA evidence by comparing proteins from different birds. He was shocked to find the results redrew the entire family tree of songbirds. We didn't get the split of the Australian songbirds and the Old World songbirds. We actually got the Old World songbirds sitting within the Australian songbirds. And I said, we just kept looking and thinking, is there an error here? Is there something we're missing? But no, that's where they were sitting. It was an explosive finding that shattered the prevailing dogma. The world's 4,500 species of songbirds, like the jays, thrushes, robins, and mockingbirds from the Northern Hemisphere, all had ancestors that traced back to Australia. But, the critics demanded, if this is where songbirds began, where's the fossil evidence? The fossils may have been here, but there wasn't actually anyone actively working on them. Very few people were working on fossils, and certainly no one on uh, detailed on songbirds, till Walter Bowles came along. While others searched for carnivorous marsupials and giant platypus, Walter sorted through the rich deposits of Riversley for tiny bird fossils. You don't know what you're going to look at and you start putting things under a microscope and suddenly you say, aha. In 1993, he identified a fragment of wing bone from Queensland that set a new world record. You can see that's quite a small little thing probably about the size of a finch. <laughs> I'm guessing what it lacks in size, it makes up for insignificance? Well, this was the earliest record of songbirds anywhere in the world, and by a substantial amount, like 25 million years earlier. And this remains the oldest found? It does. This one's about 54 million years old. He and his students have identified plenty more they're much older than songbirds from the Northern Hemisphere and too early to have evolved there and then moved here. Australia was floating slowly northwards and birds evolving in isolation, not reached close enough to Asia for things to move back and forth. Then yes, this is where the birds were evolving and the birds were singing. And not just the songbirds, in the last few years, more DNA and fossil studies have revealed Australia is the ancestral home of parrots and pigeons as well. Drawing all these strands together has led biologist Tim Lowe on a 10-year journey. He's woven them into a book called Where Song Began. And I realised, hold on, if you add all these groups of birds together, 
you are talking about a majority of individual birds in the world having Australian ancestors and also that Australia was in fact the most important continent for bird evolution, that no other continent could match that. A good place to see the results of this long history is the Gondwana Rainforest World Heritage Area in northern New South Wales. Tim wants to show me an Australian species that characterises much of what makes our birds distinctive, a type of honey eater called the bellbird. Fueled by sugar that so aggressively defends its food resource, it loves the forest to death. Calling constantly from dawn to dusk, 365 days a year, bellbirds, or bell miners, create a wall of sound to keep other birds away. Try just waiting and see if you can get a whole second when you can't hear a call. I mean, yeah. it, it's and, impossible. Yeah, that's right. There's no morning peak. It doesn't get weak in the afternoon. It is just this solid wall of sound. And that's a really clear message to birds. They're basically saying, get out of here. We speculate that it is globally completely unique. But this is a sound that's very familiar to Australians, but many of us would not be aware of the, the backstory. It's completely misinterpreted so that real estate agents will sell blocks of land with bellbirds at a premium saying, come and listen to the tinkling bells. And what they're actually selling is forest that's going to die. This is what the bell miners covet, a sugary cap called lerp, created by a minute sap-sucking bug called a psyllid. The birds actually farm the bugs by removing just the lerp, stimulating the psyllid to make more. And the birds love this. Almost all the small forest birds will eat it. And the bell miners, they're guarding. This is the resource they're guarding. So this is what all the action is about. And yeah, eat it. Aboriginal people love this food. I eat it all the time. What's in it? It's, it's the starch, sugar and a little bit of wax. So I, I think we find it very sweet, particularly after the rain last night. But the blandness, hmm. it's, it's sustaining. You can, you can get a sense that you're eating something starchy. Well, it tastes... It doesn't taste... Disgusting. It, it's, it tastes nutritious, like it's worth eating, yes. and I am getting that kind of sweet aftertaste yes. as well. But the sugar fix that bell miners jealously guard comes at a cost for the forest. By keeping out all the smaller birds that would also like to eat the sap sucking bugs, the bug numbers build up. So bell miners are eating some of them, but not enough. Trees eventually die. And that's what you can see in this stretch of forest here. It's this... a dramatic change. Yeah, that's right. You've got this massive tree death, which you can now see on a scale like this in places everywhere between southern Victoria and southern Queensland. This is a particularly bad one here, but this phenomenon is becoming really serious over a large area of Australia. So we're talking about a pretty major phenomenon, bell miner associated dieback. Be mad. Disturbances like fire, drought and logging may also play a part, but once triggered, Dieback is an epidemic driven by bell miners. It's a testament to the power of a single species of honey eater. It's very much the case, and that's one of the really strong points that can be made about Australia. We have incredibly ecologically powerful birds. Including one that's the closest alive today to the very first songbird that ever evolved, the lyrebird. They're best known for their amazing mimicry. But I've come to Victoria's Yarra Ranges to see how they change the forest. The library is a really important ecosystem engineer because it's turning over significant amounts of litter and fuel. It's able to influence the germination of plants and it's able to influence the whole structure of a forest. Daniel Nugent and Steve Leonard had a hunch that the foraging of superb lyrebirds reduces the risk of fire. Following the Black Saturday bushfires, colleagues and I noticed that the fire had often stopped at the margins of gullies where there was a lot of lyrebird activity. And that just got us wondering whether there was some connection there, whether the lyrebirds were actually forming, in effect, fire breaks. Through here is an example of a lyrebird foraging area. You can see the lyrebirds have intermixed this layer of litter and soil together 
And you can see the area extends all the way up past these ferns, some 20 odd metres. They're using their big feet and claws to scratch around and look for invertebrates to eat. And this is something that they do throughout the year. Lyrebirds can turn over more than 200 tonnes of soil per hectare a year, an incredible amount of earth moving. To test their theory about fire, the researchers set up fences to exclude lyrebirds and compare the amounts of leaf litter inside and out. 11 centimetres. At one site in particular, we found a difference of 7.5 tonnes per hectare, which is a really significant amount. Five centimetres. Mm -hmm. Over a nine-month period, they found lyrebirds reduced the fuel load by 25%. And when they fed their data into the MacArthur fire behaviour models for low to moderate fire weather, where there were lyrebirds, there was no fire. Even under extreme conditions, even when we plugged in, you know, 35 degree day with very low humidity and strong winds, the lyrebird effect was still measurable. Superb lyrebirds change more than the fuel load. Their foraging also uproots seedlings, which shapes the forest in a distinctive way. So they prevent the establishment of a mid-layer in the vegetation. So you end up with this very open forest floor and then a tall layer of small trees and large shrubs. But what's missing is a sort of mid-shrub layer, the sort of head-high stuff. And that's really important for fire behaviour because they're the ladder fuels that'll lead a fire from the floor up into the canopy where it can develop into a high-intensity fire. Learning from lyrebirds could help protect the bushland fringes of Melbourne from wildfires. You have more lyrebirds, less likelihood of fire, maybe making people safer. Such capacity to shape their environment is a trademark of many Australian birds in the land where song began. But does that mean our birds sing differently too? In the Northern Hemisphere, female bird song is unusual. Here, it's the opposite. If you think of a whip bird, it's woo, whip, choo, choo. The choo choo is the female answering. Okay, so why do we have a lot of that? Well, because our eucalypts are not deciduous, we've got evergreen forests. We, we get a lot of drought and seasonal fluctuation, but it's nothing like the severity you get in the Northern Hemisphere where most of the birds have to migrate. What you have are, are year-round territories, and this seems to facilitate the female actually telling the other females this, this area is taken. So we have a lot of um, females participating in calls here. The old view that still persists today is that Australian birds are the exception to the rule. I guess... You know, Australia gets seen as down under, but it might actually be the other way around. <laughs> the way that songbirds do things in Australia might actually be the norm in a sense. Michelle Hall and her team are tracking the lives of 400 superb fairy wrens at the Serendip Sanctuary in Victoria. Well, they're territorial during the breeding season. So if you play a song of another fairy wren on their territory, they'll usually think there's an intruder there and that'll get their attention she's particularly interested in the female songs. They have quite a complex social system. Because the males spend a lot of time off their territory, their females often sing to defend the territory. However, Darwin's classical theory of sexual selection focuses only on the males. From his Eurocentric perspective, Darwin proposed that song evolved because the boys with the best repertoire got the girls. That's the male fairy wren with the bright blue head. There's a fairly pervasive view that birdsong is something that male birds do. And anyone who lives in Australia knows that that's probably not really true. But no one had done a systematic survey before to establish how many females actually do sing. So Michelle helped to gather information from a thousand different species around the world. We found that the female song occurs in 71% of the species that we surveyed. And in a lot of species, females sing just about as much as males do. In a few species, they actually sing more than males do. When they mapped the female singers onto the family tree, there's a 92% probability that the ancestor to modern songbirds had female song. These new insights reverse the old assumptions about evolution. Perhaps instead of asking why male birds sing, we should be asking why female birds don't always sing. Um, that might give us 
a different perspective to the current one. All this leaves me looking at birds in an entirely new light. For tens of millions of years, this continent echoed with the song of their ancestors, as they not only shaped this land, but eventually the bird life in the rest of the planet. And like songbirds, parrots were also evolving here, long before anywhere else. Although their songs are not always music to our ears, one even makes its own musical instruments. The palm cockatoo of Cape York Peninsula is one of the few animals to use tools. It selects the right branch, strips off the bark and bangs its custom-made drumstick against trees to make a rhythm. The two groups of birds that overwhelmingly stand out for intelligence are the songbirds and the parrots, and we, we know they both originated in Australia. It's just fascinating. You know, we gave the world intelligent birds. And not only that, you know, the fossil record and the genetic record would imply that we had smart parrots and songbirds in Australia at least 10 or 20, maybe longer, million years before you had intelligent apes. So. In Australia, you would have had the most intelligent organisms in the world. Yes, all that course, that group would be well out. And this is where the big issues would start. Back at the Australian Museum, Walter and Les reflect on what's changed in the last 30 years and what hasn't. I helped put that gallery together when it opened in 1980. So it is now 35 years out of date and it very much reflects the old classification that was in, in use at the time. It's quite good going back in time. It is. It's starting to fill in a lot of gaps in the record now. If I was to redo a gallery like this, I'd have song, the evolution of song, and you'd have 35 to 20 million years. The rest of the world is quiet. Australia is buzzing and singing and that. And then suddenly, it starts moving through to the rest of the world. Wherever we look, from backyards to bushland, our birds continue to inspire. Birds are very easy for us to relate to. They've got beautiful colours. They've often got beautiful songs. They're doing a lot vocally, more than most animals. They're in our gardens. You can be learning about them when you're just sitting on the back veranda with a beer. You can be learning about them while you're standing at the bus stop. I mean, they're user-friendly nature. If you've filmed some interesting bird behaviour, upload your videos or photos to Facebook with the hashtag CatalystBirdWatch. Our experts will be standing by to comment.